Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, uh, the LMN um, Business Management Series uh, hosted by Mark Bradley every Tuesday at noon. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, I just wanted to cover off, for those of you that are new uh, to the webinar series, um, we're using the question function in the dashboard there of your GoToWebinar um, panel there on the right of your screen. Uh, any questions, you can go ahead and type those in I'm on that bar, and at the end of uh, today's session, we'll go ahead and do a, a Q&A with Mark uh, and cover off everything you, that you need. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Mark. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, today we're going to talk about waste elimination um, and focus on the nine types of waste and 5S um, as a tool to help eliminate um, those nine types of waste. Um, to get started, healthy profits, um, you know, often that's kind of a focus in business. Obviously, it's hard to hard to run a great company if, if you're not profitable. So, um, you know, I, I think often we look to our employees to help deliver these um, above average profits, but we may not always have uh, systems and training in place to kind of help them um deliver that in a more sort of repeatable way and we kind of you know we talk about things like culture and and uh and work ethics and common sense and all these different things in our businesses but i think often um with a little bit more awareness around training uh related to waste elimination we can really get a lot more out of our team um because it does sort of become more um, automated when people just know how to identify waste and they understand why the systems are in place to eliminate it. So let's just talk about a few things that happen day to day in, in landscape companies. So first off, um, you know, how often is it uh, happening in your business where a crew either leaves and gets to site without a, a tool that they need, or maybe they forgot the gas can, or maybe they even forgot material that they're going to put in. Uh, what what happens next? You know, in most companies, unfortunately, the foreman or the crew leader leaves to go and replace that um, forgotten tool or or material that's required to do the work. And you know, we I think we just get to the point in our companies where we start to accept this as being something that happens or you know, we kind of almost make light of it and and uh, talk about it as if it's, you know, so ridiculous that um, it happens, but, you know, we can't do anything about it. And I think that's when, you know, we've kind of made our biggest mistake is when we know that the problem exists, but we don't really do anything to fix it um, and fix it in a more systemic way so that it's not going to continue to happen at all. Um, so first off, I think when it comes to this type of waste, I think it's important to train the staff how much mistakes like this actually cost. So when you forget a tool, it costs us money and here's what it costs us. And I think when you explain it this way, it starts to become a little bit more real and tangible to the people that um, really have the control over whether or not things like this happen. So first off, the foreman leaves, heads back to the shop, um, We've got two hours of, of, of true waste there where the foreman's not producing at all. Um, the crew then is now working unsupervised, so it slows their productivity down. So there's another two hours um, uh, of waste. We've got the fuel cost of returning to the shop and the wear and tear and whatnot. But the big one that I think most people don't focus enough on is the lost opportunity. So that's really what could I have gotten done in the time that I was, you know, going back to pick up a forgotten tool or, or something similar. And, and I think that's where the difference between really profitable companies and not so profitable companies often lies. First off, you know, all things being equal, you got to know how to price your work. You got to understand overhead recovery. But once those things are, are, are finished up and sort of, uh, nailed down, it really becomes which company is more efficient at getting the work done. That's the company that's going to be most profitable and usually most competitive in the marketplace in terms of pricing. In other words, if you're super efficient, 
you could price your jobs um, at or below your competitor's price and you're going to make more money because you can get it done faster because you're not wasting the potential profits doing things like this. And I think almost every landscape company can um, compete on efficiency once they understand waste elimination regardless of a lot of the other costs in the business. In other words, you know, what truck you have and, and how much you pay your foreman and those types of things actually become a little lower on on the um, uh, sort of level of importance when it comes to planning for profit than having an efficient company. Because as you can imagine, paying somebody an extra couple bucks an hour becomes pretty insignificant when things like this aren't happening in our businesses. So the real cost of forgetting, forgetting that tool is $484. Ask yourself how many times a day this happens in your crews, whether it's you know the way they fill up or the way they stop to, to for lunch or the way they you know um, uh, stop for washroom breaks, the route that they drive, how they get their material if they you know, think of what materials they need midday rather than loading at night. They're just the list is endless. So there's just so many ways that this can can happen. We're using a tool as an example, but this happens in many, many ways in our businesses. So, you know, the real cost of waste is is usually um, for a construction crew in around $100 per man hour and for maintenance in around 58 your numbers are your numbers and and the budgeting software helps you understand what these numbers are so you know but these these are good industry standard numbers so you can imagine when you're wasting time doing things like uh, uh, rework and and going to pick up things that you've forgotten all the time that you're spending doing those things could have been billed out at these rates which has a big impact at the end of the year and that's why you see companies who with the same number of employees are doing 30, 40, 50% more revenue than others. And, and really the way they do that is just eliminating all of those flow interrupters and they kind of focus on getting all of the billable hours possible out of their staff and actually getting work, value added work done every minute of the day. And, and the way to do that is really to, to, to train the staff to identify waste and understand the cost of what that waste really looks like. And, and that's really what we're talking about here today. Um, so to get started with that, um, the, there's nine types of waste. And I didn't come up with this. This is you know straight out of the book, The Toyota Way. So if you want to read a great book, um, that would be my suggestion. So that's The Toyota Way. Um, I read that book pretty early in my career. And it was something that I really um, could never really stop thinking about. Um, it really kind of forces a continuous improvement mindset. And, you know, growing up, uh, I, I, I think I, I had that kind of uh, upbringing. You know, my, my, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, a father that, that worked in construction and, and, and really gave me those um, skills sort of day by day. But I, I really realized once I started hiring staff and crews and, and bringing people on that not everybody really saw waste as, as waste. It, it's not natural. And, you know, you might say, well, it's common sense. These things shouldn't happen. And, you know, I don't know about common sense if if we can rely on that uh, to run businesses. It's, it's I certainly haven't had success counting on common sense. I think what you have to do is is share your way of thinking and then sort of back it with some systems and, and, you know, at least in the early stages, have some sort of an audit process so that it becomes a little bit more um, a part of the company culture and DNA. So the, identifying the nine types of waste really is step one. So first off, you know, a waste inspection procedure is a, is a great tool. Um, and a waste observation summary is, a, is another great tool. A lot of these resources can be found in our systems library if you're an LMN customer. Um, there's all kinds of forms and documents to help you implement a waste elimination process like this. There's more resources beyond this as well. Um, but let's talk about the nine types. So first off, the first type of waste is waiting. 
like waiting in the landscape business, it becomes kind of part of uh, the day and people start to just accept it. We wait for instructions at the shop. Often there's you know a lineup of people waiting to talk to the owner or manager. We're waiting for reloading and, and fuel and material deliveries. They're just the waiting kind of goes on and on throughout the day. And I think, you know, when we start to accept it, that waiting is okay, um, that's where we make our biggest mistake. We have to kind of identify all the stages in our day that are causing a wait, and then we have to figure out a system to eliminate those, uh, those waiting uh, periods. So whether it's the way you're planning your work, um, obviously with LMN time, you can, you can eliminate a lot of that because you know uh, what you're there to do and you can, you can build job specs and, and virtual binders and everything you need to, to get the work done more efficiently. But beyond that, the way you um, stock your equipment trailers or your tool trucks or however you um, transport your, your equipment from job to job, often you know people are apprehensive to invest in equipment uh, and efficiency equipment. So, you know, they'll they'll use open trailers for maintenance crews that they have to load and unload every night. And, uh, you know, when it would be so easy to, to use a covered trailer that could be um, uh, kept uh, together each night. You know, you forget fewer things, everything's well organized. But in your company, you should be able to, be able to identify what you could do to eliminate some of this waiting. Um, maybe it's the way you get your materials um, delivered to the job site. Maybe it's the way you fuel your trucks. Uh, there's just so many things that you could uh, focus on. A big one quite often for install crews is material deliveries and material management. Um, often crews are working inefficiently because they don't have the right materials at the right time and they spend a ton of time waiting for deliveries or trucks for for haulage to take material off-site there's just you know the list is endless of, of of places where you may end up waiting waste number two is movement so the in, the unnecessary or extra movement of people equipment or materials so this one's big on job sites where you might be stocking material taking deliveries you know staging material here and there Often people end up kind of moving material around more than they should. Um, another good example is, you know, you go inside the trailer, if you use a tool trailer to, to, to get, you know, nails or screws or a tool, and you can't find it because everything's disorganized. Um, or you go in the shop to get loaded up for the day and, you know, tools are missing, they're not in their place, there's no stock of, of basic, um, consumables you know things that you use on a daily basis and you know or you go to get gas and and the cans are all empty there's just so many ways that this happens and you end up moving around a lot more than you need to because you know you're just not well set up so um, wasting time moving things around two three four times is a big one in in a business that requires so much movement um, in 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 as, as, as we have so you know how do we fix it obviously you know getting a really organized with your trailers your shop your yard that's an easy one um, making sure that we train our staff to work efficiently if you're if you're doing the work say for example loading um, bringing pavers to somebody that's laying pavers um, training the staff how to carry pavers how to set them down where to set them down you know don't set them six feet behind the person laying the stone set them right beside their knees so that they barely have to bend and twist and move to grab the pavers and place them there's just so many ways that we can be more efficient in the way that we minimize movement um, another big one is you know over shipping materials and having to to move things around the site three times because you're, you're taking too much material on the job site at once. There's just all kinds of ways that we can minimize this type of waste. Transportation's a really big one. Um, a common problem, I think, you know, we get a lot of routes that, whether it's maintenance or snow, um, that we're servicing. And the routes are often way too spread out and this happens naturally as our businesses grow we 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 want to take on more business but 
in order to do so, we start sort of spreading the territory that we work in. And when we do that, you know, inevitably we're getting a lot more drive time. And when we're not revisiting that root density often enough, I think we end up with a lot of waste. Sometimes, you know, you go from 10% drive time to 30 or 35% drive time just by adding a few sites that are inconvenient. Um, Another big one is, you know, landscapers like to pick up their own materials for some reason. And I realize with certain types of things, you, you may need to hand pick things to, to get what you want. But a lot of times, you know, we're, we're picking up commodity items like sand and gravel or pavers and things that we don't need to hand pick. And when we do that, you know, often we're using small trucks. Um, we're doing way too many trips and we're doing that while we should be producing work instead of just paying a small delivery fee. The delivery fees cost way more than the lost opportunity of your crews out doing the work. Drive time I want to focus on specifically though. If you're not thinking about root density, then this is a good little example of why you should be. So if you had, you know, your your stops sort of strewn around in a typical way, you might spend on, on the course of a day, 80 minutes on your drive time. If you really focus your efforts into smaller neighborhoods and, and really um, sell based around root density, which does require some outbound sales, you might be able to cut that drive time down to 20 minutes. And with that extra hour a day that you're actually producing, this is the impact. And I think a lot of people don't take the time to, to calculate this. When you can take your daily drive time for that crew from 80 minutes down to 20, the revenue impact is incredibly big. So you can see the revenue lost per year on the far right column, it really adds up from the tight route up to the, to the more distant route. But a tighter route can basically add 25 to $30,000 a year in revenue, depending on, you know, obviously the equipment makeup and the size of the crew. But this is a, has a big impact uh, at the end of the year when you've got multiple crews. If you've got five crews, that's $132,000 a year just by getting your, your root densities figured out. And I think often people overlook that. We could bid it a little bit cheaper or we could just make more money. Either way, it's, it's an advantage and it should be an advantage that you're using when you're, when you're thinking about your business. Um, the way to do it, if you're not really out focused on root density right now, it's simple. You know, pull into the neighborhood that you have uh, projects in right now, our contracts, and try to measure them up online. We've got the online measuring tool built right into the estimating software. Bid those jobs out quickly. You can either submit them, you know, walk in the front doors and see if you can make contact. Or you know, uh, do some recon and uh, and try to book a meeting to, to to sell that job. But either way, outbound sales has a big impact because it allows you to focus on the work you want, not just the work that comes your way, as it does when the phone rings. And also, it allows you to really focus on root density, which is where a lot of uh, profit opportunity sits. Um, but again, this transportation waste, we can focus on density, we can book deliveries, we can, you know, get some basic stock at the yard for things we use a lot. There's all kinds of ways to really focus on it and keep your transportation waste to a minimum. Overproduction, this one happens kind of naturally and, it, and it's funny, the more you focus on quality in your business, I feel like this almost starts to take on a little bit of a life of its own. We all want to do good quality work and we kind of, um, ask our employees to go the extra step and make sure that our customer experience is optimal. But I think what happens sometimes is just through minim, uh, minimal training efforts or, you know, maybe even just sometimes a mis misunderstanding or a lack of communication and training in general, we end up having our crews doing things that aren't required and that we're not charging for to the point where we're not going to be profitable. And this happens um, in many different ways, but you know, here's a few examples. You know, putting too much material down, whether it's mulch or fertilizer or salt, um, cutting or or plowing areas that are not even in the scope of work, um, delivering way too much materials to job sites, 
digging too deep is a big one. You know, people prepping base for for pavers or um, or driveways and and things like that. They're they're digging way too deep, which leads to a lot of extra work because you've got to get rid of that extra dirt and put more gravel in and take the time to pack it. And then you got the shipping time. You know, the waste gets rampant when we start to overproduce. And these are things for, that we're not charging for in our estimate. So it just comes right out of profit. So we have to be really um, aware of overproduction and we got to try to focus on eliminating it as much as possible. So lots more communication to the crew around what the scope of work is, which we can we can accomplish that in LMN time for sure. We don't want to deliver more material than we need. So we have to be accurate in our in our takeoff estimates. Um, we need to train our staff on how to approach the job site properly. And then we need to give them as much information so that they can make good decisions and not make these types of mistakes um, while they're working independently. The job site uh, um, uh, map is an integral, integral part of this. Um, on a big job site, you just can't operate without one. But I think this is important, you know, even on smaller jobs. But you can see here, um, just highlighting all the things that you're going to actually include for whether it be mowing or bed maintenance, um, again, whether it's snow plowing, anything, the more information you can put on that site map, the more the crew can make decisions for themselves. Um, so one thing that we baked into the system to help eliminate overproduction, obviously, is the real-time awareness of project hours. When your crews know how long they have to be at each job, they just naturally start to get better at avoiding overproduction because they're trying to stay on time. So get, sharing that kind of information and making sure that your crew understands how long jobs are bid for in the estimating process really allows them to kind of self-regulate. And I think naturally they start to eliminate overproduction. Um, waste five is processing. And this is something I know myself in my career, I've made this mistake many times, is creating over, overly complicated um, systems and processes. And this is where we, we try to fix a problem by introducing a system, but the systems are so complicated and clunky that we don't end up really using them. And what happens next is um, when we don't use the systems completely, then lots of things kind of go sideways. And I think we end up having a lot more mistakes and uh, waste in our systems because nothing's really flowing smooth. And I, I think, you know, a, a lot of what we built in the LMN system was designed to, to take that information from estimating and sales, put it into the field staff's hands so that they can use that information to deliver the work efficiently and then have that information flow back to the office so that we can job cost and um, course correct where we might be making problems in estimating or otherwise so that we can just continuously get better. But, you know, obviously um, lots of systems happen in our companies that are not part of LMN. You know, one might be your fueling system. What, where do you suggest that they fill the trucks every day? Um, is that at the yard? Is it at a gas station? What time of day do they do that? What what are you tracking in the process? How do they manage that paperwork? That it 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 all sounds simple, but when you don't have a system or when the system's too complicated, it really can turn into a great deal of waste. Um, so we want to streamline the paperwork. That's why we built LMN to begin with. It was out of a need that we had at my own company. But basically, we want to take all the payroll and daily notes. We want GPS. We want job costing. And we want to share the timelines with the crews so that they can work efficiently. So obviously, there's some savings there. We want to save office hours, reduce the waste there. We want to reduce the waste on rounding uh, time. And ultimately, what we really want to do is reduce all these nine types of waste by giving the field staff insight into what's actually happening and how long the jobs were bid for so that they start to recognize if they have a timeline to adhere to 
that they'll have a lot more success sticking to it when um, when they eliminate the waste. <coughs> so obviously, there's some things that we can do um, to, to to minimize it, but in every company, I think you got to look closely at your own systems and find the broken ones, and then kind of simplify and and just keep uh, improving on um, those systems so that you can really kind of eliminate a lot of the waste associated with all that processing time. Waste number six, inventory management. This is a big one. Lots of times in workshops, people ask questions about inventory. What what should I hold? What shouldn't I hold? <coughs> Excuse me. How, uh, <coughs> how, um, how much, um, threshold should I hold in my yard and often what I say is only keep things in inventory that you need every day if it's something that you need once in a while then you should be shipping it either to the job site or to the yard um, I was just saying um, in general a good rule of thumb keep the inventory to a minimum um, because it t does take a lot of work to move it around Obviously, things die, uh, bags get wet, damage, that kind of thing. Keep the minimum inventory that you need to work efficiently each day. But, you know, more frequent uh, uh, deliveries are, is probably easier to manage than a lot of inventory of your own. Uh, defective work, this one, we all have it. Uh, we don't want to admit it, but, you know, sometimes the defective work is a result of the owner either of the landscape company either not really giving good clear specifications or not giving good enough training to their staff. Um, sometimes it's uh, you know related to layout mistakes, grading mistakes, you know, but generally some sort of poor planning has come out and uh, turned into defective work. Sometimes you know employees make mistakes for sure, but I always think that you know, looking back at the the issues that I've had related to effective work over the years, when I really look at the root cause, it was usually a combination of things. And it did always kind of start with um, a lack of training or uh, poor, poor job planning. So um, really good layout practices, you know, approval of grading um, layout, um, having proper specifications for the materials for the jobs, a, a proper drawing um, that's to scale uh, before starting work. These are things that are, you know, requirements if you're in the in the design build or installation business. On the maintenance side of things, really good training, well maintained equipment, um, and really good understanding of project scope with those site maps that I talked about earlier can really um, minimize this. And, you know, defective work is a tough one because it while we're fixing that work, we should be um, out producing new work. So it's a really expensive one to uh, uh, fix. In other words, you know, it's worth spending the time on your company to, to make uh, specific plans around training to avoid defective work. So, you know, make sure that your work specifications are clear. Make sure that your crews have the tools to work efficiently. Zip levels are a great little tool for, for grading and layout. Um, set up templates um, with really good crew work, crew notes um, in your estimates so that when your crews are looking at the job, the specs are there. Um, you know, if you're going to do a lot of hardscape installations, you, know, you can create specs for paver installs and put them in your your uh, crew notes so that it's the same every time and your crew becomes uh, really aware and, you know, your, your project plan is almost a training tool. It, it's that good. Um, waste number eight, unused creativity. This one is, I, I think, common in all businesses and, and you know, Unfortunately, as owners, sometimes we hear suggestions, but we don't really digest them or really understand why they're, um, you know, coming out. And I think what we need to do as owners is 
take the imp the information from the the staff and actually put it to work so that you know we can capture that um, creativity and those ideas from the people who are doing the work every day so um, obviously you know, most companies uh, have meetings but often the meetings are are one way so you know it's kind of the the owner talking at the employees or manager talking at the employees rather than you know creating a, a two-way dialogue and I think when there's a problem or when there's an, an inefficiency the more you can engage the staff the more likely you are to fix the problem for a few reasons. First off, they'll have good ideas and solutions, but also they're more likely to um, engage and see them through when they were their suggestions in the first place. Um, I think we often underestimate just how um, valuable that staff input can be. And I think we can probably um, put that to work in in ways where um, it becomes a little bit more systemic in our businesses. So one is that that worked really well for me is rather than a suggestion box, and at the time I think we had a suggestion box and and this suggestion of creating a ideas at um, email address uh, was actually dropped into the suggestion box. <laughs> but this day and age, we don't need a, a paper uh, process. We can just simply create an email address for your company that just says ideas at. And then when your employees come up with an idea or rather than standing around griping about something that, that isn't in place, they can send an email to that address. And then those emails should get brought up um, on a regular basis at the meetings or if you do have a continuous improvement board, they can get posted on the board and then people can sort of follow those through and see what actually happened. Um, and, you know, something like that might look like this, where we've got <clears throat> our ideas, um, we've, we've, we're discussing them. They might be, you know, in a, in a planning stage, they might be in motion or it might actually be happening. And I think when we put the ideas up on the wall, and um, then people see them actually getting put into effect, you get a, a much better um, uptake and, and much better outcome uh, as a company. Last type of waste, resisting change. Um, not really committing to changing anything. And this is common as, as entrepreneurs, we, you know, we've got financial pressures and time constraints and, and you know, just too many places to be um, at once and you know we hear the ideas but we don't really um, embrace them or or put them into action and I think when that happens you know whether it's resisting you know uh, software uh, adoption or um, getting a truck that is going to uh, use roll-off bins to, to improve job site efficiency and whatever it happens to be, or, you know, putting a bigger mower out or getting um, skid steer and excavator for every install crew, whatever that change is, if you're resisting it, you have to ask yourself why. And I think, you know, unless there's a, a mathematical excuse of why you can't do that, that actually makes sense, then you should really sort of um, make the time to at least delegate that responsibility to somebody who can make the change. Um, I think often as owners, we see the changes, um, we know that they're needed, but we don't have the time to do it. And we don't, we're not good enough at delegating to just simply hand that task off to somebody and let them run with it. And when we're, I think that's where a lot of the resistance happens. And I, and I think overcoming it um is is kind of the key to success so although it's the ninth type of waste i think resisting change is probably um the the most important one to to fix and and often it's just a mindset um <clears throat> so a few examples you know holding employees accountable for not following new systems or existing processes in the company um i think you know having the strength to to let somebody go 
sometimes you've got staff that exist in the company who just will not change and they won't adapt to the way things are or the way things need to be in the company as it grows or as it improves. Um, a continuous mindset, improvement mindset, uh, really relies on a willingness to change. And sometimes people just don't have that. Um, keeping up on education, embracing technology, basing decisions on facts and numbers instead of just gut instincts. You know, do the math on it. Check what the, the p potential return on time invested is and or, or you know, run a cost benefit analysis on some of the uh, decisions that you're trying to make before saying no. Um, next up, we're going to talk about the 5S workplace organization procedure. And again, this is um, a, a Toyota principle as well. 5S is really just a system that will allow you to eliminate waste in your business and sort of talk a common language with your staff. So it's pretty simple at its core. It's a, a continuous improvement waste elimination system. So you're gonna use this system to organize your work sites, whether it's a shop, or a trailer, your office, or the actual job site. It's really, sort of a, a way of doing business and a way of sort of operating efficiently. So what does it stand for? First off, it's very simple. There's five S's. It's first we're gonna sort, set and order, shine, standardize and sustain. So five S's, each stands for a stage in the process. And really, you know, anytime something needs organization, if you think about it, first you sort it, then you set it in order, then you shine, then you standardize it, and you sustain that. Um, <clears throat> so when you implement 5S, um, this is what happens. Really, you're going to reduce a lot of downtime. You're going to improve your productivity. Your quality will inevitably get better. The company image is better your staff are a lot more um, a lot more at peace in their day and you're definitely going to increase your profits so step one sort um, sort <clears throat> sounds simple and you know we've all cleaned out a truck or a shop or straightened up um, a trailer if you use uh, covered trailers or or, or whatever um, but this is where we really kind of identify what do we actually need in this in this uh, situation and what don't we need and we we kind of eliminate things that shouldn't be there or just don't need to be there things that we're not going to need on a daily basis and um, this is our opportunity to kind of simplify um, our, our our job site or our office shop um, trailer whatever it happens to be once we get things sorted we're, we're on our way to, to simple um, set in order means that everything has its right place. And this is where we're going to actually start to label things so that it becomes a little bit more systemized. We can't even get the label maker out when we don't have everything in its own place. So what we're saying here is let's give everything a place and let's make sure it's the right place so that we can work efficiently so that anybody can find these things moving forward. When we label all these locations, then it becomes more of a, a system. And that's really, I think, where um, it becomes uh, sustainable. So if we've got covered trailers, when we, when we get in those trailers, we want them to be standardized in the sense that everything has a place, there's storage locations, everything's labeled so that we can work efficiently. And when we start to train our staff, it becomes very easy. We can train them where to get things um, within minutes because when you walk in a labeled trailer, it's obvious. Um, when you walk in a yard where everything's labeled, it's obvious. You know where to pick things up because there's a label to tell you where to pick things up. And it just becomes part of your, uh, you know your company culture to work this way when when this is the way you're set up so an organized shop and yard um, 
you know, could be different things in different companies, but um, depending on the type of work you do, identify what uh, major categories you have and within each category, what items you're going to kind of keep, what items you're going to inventory, what ones are, need to be held where, and then, you know, systemize it by labeling things and creating thresholds for inventory if you do have some. Um, step three is cleaning things up. Um, once everything has its place and we know the way things need to be, then it's just important to keep it super orderly and clean. And this has got to be baked into a system as well. If you're going to take the time to, to get a trailer set up like those pictures I just showed you, you also need to have time each week to kind of restock and keep it that way. And whether that's you know, at the end of every day or once a week, you know, or a combination of the two, um, the shine component is super important. Um, I think often we kind of do the first two S's and then we stop there. Um, shine is ongoing. It's not clean it once and then clean it again when it's dirty. It's clean it continuously. Keep things orderly continuously so that it's always like that. Um, then we don't ever have the need for a big cleanup. The standardization piece is really, you know, a, a way of keeping things happening on a daily basis um, within that within those first three S's, which is, you know, the sort, set, and order, and chime. We need to make sure that this happens every day, and that's when it's kind of standardized. And that's just kind of making sure that we always do things um in a consistent way so that we get a consistent output um the last step sustain this is kind of creating a habit of keeping things um in order so sustain it happens um i think primarily through an audit process and if you go into the systems library on lmn you'll find the 5s system with the training tools and the audit paperwork and again these these forms are all customizable but you know when you first start uh with the 5s program you might need to audit weekly and then you might be able to back that off to bi-weekly or monthly or you know maybe even quarterly eventually for some things but uh, having an audit process kind of helps you build the um the habit and over time, you'll notice you don't need to audit as often because it really just becomes automatic. Um, but the sustained component of the 5S system is super important. Um, it doesn't work unless you sustain it. So the audit system and connecting that up to um, your employee uh, bonuses or some other type of a program that you might put in place, a rewards program associated with 5S and, and waste elimination. Um, that type of a, of a mindset um, will continue to kind of grow on its own after you've kind of gone to the initial efforts. In other words, you know, your foreman will, will be the ambassadors of this program on an ongoing basis because they are going to enjoy their work a lot more when it's well organized and it's simple when everything has its place and their day becomes more peaceful but they may not identify that for themselves they might not you might have a messy foreman in other words right now but once they start working like this for 3 4 or 5 weeks they're not going to want to go back to the messy way because it's stressful and they can see how much more they enjoy their job when they work in a in a really neat and tidy and well organized environment. Um, but as I said, you can't always make a habit overnight, and you certainly can't have it just by cleaning out a trailer. Um, the habit comes through the auditing process. Um, so again, all these forms and documents are in the systems library. They're there for you to to adapt and change and, and put into effect in your own company. So hopefully uh, you can check that out for yourself. Um, we also have some 5S um, and waste elimination videos on our YouTube channel um, and some training aids actually that we built on YouTube 
for you to use with your staff at uh, staff training meetings as well. So lots there um, on this topic. Um, I think it's where your biggest opportunity for, for above average profits and wages for your team uh, sit. Um, a highly efficient company will always produce more revenue, which means more money for everybody and definitely a lot more success in other ways beyond money. Work becomes a lot more fun. Um, it's good to be organized. It's good to have a, a sort of a, a clean mind uh, when you're working. And I think uh, an efficient company always delivers that. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, um, the new customer portal launched just last week. Um, lots of new features for, for you to, to obviously improve efficiency in the way you manage your business and manage your customer relationships. Um, the customer portal will allow you to uh, take payments online. It's gonna save you from collecting, uh, allow your customers to, to see a lot more information online. And uh, as we continue to add to that uh, product, we're gonna add all kinds of uh, interesting features in there for you to do uh, business with your customers um, more virtually. Um, but yeah, please check it out. Um, reviewing and approving estimates, requesting work orders, checking out the upcoming schedule. All these features will really uh, save you a lot of headaches um, uh, and a lot of uh, wasted time and effort. Uh, as always, you can, you can stay connected with uh, us at LMN and all of the other companies that use LMN on the Facebook user group or the LinkedIn user group. And uh, we've always got our staff uh, waiting to, to help whether it be one-on-one -on -one or you know through some of our work, virtual workshops academy online programs um, whatever we can do to help we're always here um, we know that uh, uh, using software to run the business is is a is a is an investment of your time and, and we do whatever we can here to help make it as easy as possible so so please take advantage of uh, of those things as well um, with that, I'll open up to, to questions if anybody uh, has any. That's great. Thanks, Mark. We've got a couple of questions here, a few people questions, actually. So we have trouble getting crews to get out of the door for 7 a.m. as they tend to chat with each other. How do you get your crews out the door to site on time? Yeah, that's a good question. I think what I found worked best there was getting the foreman or whoever drives the truck um, to start 15 to 20 minutes before um, the rest of the crew. And that way they are sort of, um, uh, their start time is actually different. So it's not just, hey, come in early. It's my start time is, you know, 6.45, not, and the rest of the crew starts at seven. Um, then their mindset is I need to have that truck loaded started and sitting at the gate ready to pull out so that the other employees can jump in at seven o'clock and we drive out the gate that works i don't know of anything else that does i think anytime you have all of your staff start at one time you're going to end up with um a morning discussion and you know some people say well hey that's healthy you know everybody you got to build culture somehow and my thought is you know they've got 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get to the to the job site and they spend all day together. They don't need an extra five or 10 minutes in the morning to stand around and talk about uh, what happened the night before. And I think the four o'clock floor helps with this because it kind of forces the, 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 the conversation at the end of the day about what what's needed for the next day. So they have the opportunity to load when they get back to the yard. I think, you know, load the trucks at trucks and trailers at night wherever possible and refuel. Then in the morning, it should be very minor, you know, a, a circle check on the truck, you know, a couple basic little things, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, maintenance and that kind of thing. And then fire the truck up and be waiting at the gate. And, and for my, I think the most efficient way is just have um, the driver starting early. That's great. Um, another one here about uh, crews. So what's your stance on smoke breaks and how would you address this in a diplomatic way so that you don't demoralize your crews? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I'm not the most patient person around smoking, but 
Um, so I think the easy thing to do there is, you know, if when the work, if, if, if it's a maintenance crew, I think at the end of each stop, once you've loaded the equipment back on the trailer and you're ready to go to the next location, I think that's a good opportunity for, for a smoke break. Um, and then aside from that, I think your, your standard break times. So you should be um, usually having a mid-morning break, a lunch hour break, mid-afternoon break. I think those are the, the other times that should be set aside. So it's either a break or when you're relocating from site to site if you're in the maintenance business. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, Mark, at what point would, should someone look to having gas available at their yard versus going to stations? Um, was theft ever an issue for you having the um, fuel at the yard? <clears throat> no, a fuel at the yard is a fairly easy thing to manage. I think, you know, once you have uh, even three trucks, it makes sense to have fuel at the yard. Um, you know, most farmers have fuel at the yard and they just have, you know, a couple tractors and a and a pickup truck. It, it's it's kind of a a, a, a natural um, thing to do to to eliminate the, the the time waste and improve efficiency, and it's and it it also saves money because you usually pay a little bit less for the fuel. So I think you know that would be the threshold for having it. I've not had a lot of problems with theft. I mean, if you if you have the the tanks locked, and if you um, disarm the power to them overnight then there's really not a lot of risk on theft. Um, the other thing that I would say with um, having fuel is, depending on how big the company is, there's probably a point where if you've got, you know, 15 to 25 uh, items needing to get filled each day, you can actually have a fuel truck come in and refuel everything in position at night that was kind of what we moved to over a period of time and we always had fuel tanks as well but um we didn't have uh um the, our staff filling things up themselves after a while we just went directly to uh in position fueling Great, thank you. And we've got uh, time for one more question here, Mark. Um, it seems we're always scrambling to collect paperwork for job sites so that we can bill and job cost. How do you get your crews to hand in their paperwork on time? Uh, well, I mean, when you, with LMN, it's quite easy. Um, if you have an admin person, I mean, if you've got a number of crews, that's usually when you have more problems with, with paperwork and and uh, job costing uh, data collection. If you um, have your LMN admin person check each morning, let's say around 10 o'clock, just to see if all the crews have clocked in. And this this is something that you know doesn't have to happen forever. It it just helps improve the habit. They can see whether or not they're clocking in in real time and managing things, so they can send reminders to help, um, you know, out with building the habit. And then also, if at the end of the week they're not completing their time records accurately, um, I would issue corrective actions. So, you know, I, I believe in the three strike strike rule, and and you know, it's quite simple. If you won't complete the paperwork, then you're costing us money. It's just, it's very close to stealing in my mind in the sense that you're not completing any of the paperwork. We can't bill our customers and we're losing money and you know it. And that's pretty reckless. So that's a big deal for me. I, I think that's reason to, to let somebody go. Um, the corrective action program usually helps eliminate that early on. I don't think most landscapers put enough emphasis on a corrective action program. Um, and then I think, um, you know, putting paperwork in, it, you know, we all stop at landscape supply centers. We have receipts for fuel and different things that we pick up in the course of a day. My way of do dealing with that was always to have a stamp in the truck so we'd stamp it. Those little stamps were like one inch by two inch. You can get them made at Staples. They're not very expensive. Uh, they're self-inking. 
and that would just have the company logo and all we wanted was the job site address and the work area that it was used for so if it was um, uh, trimmer line because we ran out of trimmer line that's that's obvious if it was you know flagstone um, we'd want to know uh, what what job site it went to um, you know trimmer line not so much and then when that paperwork goes in each day at the end of the day, basically what happens is in the truck, they, they get back at the end of the day when they go in the shop, every crew has an inbox. You drop your, your paperwork from the day in that inbox um, and that's done. That's job costing. You've collected all the data in the field with LMN and you've put your, uh, your stamped receipts in every night. And at the end of the day, that's all uh, that's all that's required. And if it's not happening, use a corrective action policy to uh, to make uh, the employees aware of the seriousness. And if they won't conform, then you got to let them go, regardless of how good of an employee they are. Because if you can't manage the financial side of the business, then uh, then they're not good employees at all. That's great, Mark. Thank you. I think the last thing we wanted to wrap up with was if you could tell us a little bit about um, your next series starting for the month of May on Tuesdays at noon. Oh, yeah. Um, so May, we're going to focus on estimating. Uh, I'm going to do a four-part series just talking a lot about estimating um, tips and tricks. Uh, we're going to use the software. So, I mean, if you're not estimating using LMN, you'll see how how I would recommend doing that, but more so on um, how to estimate to win. What what techniques that um, we use to win work, knowing that you know our competitors may not be looking at things quite the same way. So a lot of things around efficiency, um, you know, even a sales strategy involving estimating different ways to present the work, different ways to to do the work, value engineering, going to talk about a lot of things like that. Um, so we're going to focus on uh, landscape maintenance, um, uh, design build, um, tender build, so more commercial bid type work. And then we're going to focus on snow at the end of May as well, because June and July, you should be getting your uh, proposals out. So we're going to really kind of make May an estimating focus. I always felt that one of the highest um, priorities for me was to review and improve at, and approve estimates uh, in my company. I, I always uh, gave the final approval on on the estimates, and I think there's just so much opportunity to make more profit and be more competitive and really set up to to do the work efficiently when when you really review estimates and manage estimates in a certain way so we're gonna we're gonna spend the month on that i'm gonna do a four-part series and uh hopefully everybody can can take part in those and and uh um learn a thing or two and and hopefully even contribute a thing or two it's always always good to get some two-way dialogue on on some of these things that's great thanks very much mark that's everything for today okay thanks thanks everyone for joining